First Corinthians chapter 10. This is um, one of the messages that um, it's not a kind of a grace-filled sermon. And Paul had to really correct the Corinthian church in this area. He had to warn them. And he warned them over and over and over again. And people think, well, you know, just because we're under grace and Jesus died for us, and no, we could kind of like, you know, do whatever we want now. And that is not the case. The Bible says we're not our own. We are bought with a price. Jesus died for us. He wants to use us. It's up to, to us to surrender and to submit to what the Lord has for us. Well, how do we know how to sur- what to surrender to and how to submit? And how, do, how do we know that? Well, he's given to us his word, okay? Now, in, in the portion that we're in, Paul is writing to them, telling them basically that they need to give up their rights. That Christianity isn't about this is my right and this is what I deserve and because Jesus did this for me, I get to have this and I get to take that and everything is me, 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 me. It's not that. It's the opposite. Because Jesus died for you, because Jesus loves you, because God has done everything for us, we're supposed to be giving up our rights to bless others. We're supposed to be giving up our rights and laying down our lives and losing our lives. And the Bible says when we do that, we really find our lives. And this is what Paul tries to explain to them. Now remember, he just gets through the portion of Scripture where he talks about, I'm giving up my rights to take a a salary from that church. And he says, Peter's taking a salary and a wife. And he goes, you guys aren't mature enough to be able to pay a pastor to pay a leader. So I'm going to give that right up because I don't want to hinder the gospel. And and, and he just gets through teaching them. You guys are supporting all these other pastors. They're really taking advantage of you. And Paul says, but that's okay. I'll give up my rights. And to be an example to you that this is how you're supposed to treat one another. This is how you're supposed to love one another. It's not about why can't I have this and why can't I get that and why doesn't the church do this for me and why don't people give to me? It's supposed to be the other way around. I'm giving up my rights. I'm giving up my things. I'm not doing that because I want to be a blessing to others. And, and, And that's what Paul just got through talking to them about and modeling before them. And that's why when he gets the, to the end of, verse, of chapter 9, let's look there. Verse 24. Know you not that they which run in a race run all, but one receives a prize, so run that you may obtain it. And every man that strives for the mastery is tempered in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beats the air, but I keep my body and bring it into subjection, or bring it to my to be my slave. Lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Paul says this, I don't want to just be a talker. I don't want to just be one who goes out and preaches and talks about holy living and talks about living for Jesus and talks about loving others. I don't want to be a talker. I don't want to be a hypocrite. He goes, I want to be a doer. And how many, how many of us can just talk a good game? We can praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise Jesus. But God knows what's going on in our hearts and our homes. And every one of us is a hypocrite in one way, shape, or form, some of us bigger than others. But Paul says, I don't want to be that. He says, I don't want to just preach to others. I don't want to just teach others if I'm not living the gospel myself. Paul says, I don't want to teach you, Corinthian church, to give up your rights and stop the division in the church and stop dividing one another. I don't want to teach you to give up your rights if I'm not giving up my rights. That's what he says. He goes, I don't want to just tell you to do something that I'm not willing to do. You know, our pastors teach us, if you want the people to give more, then the pastor should give more. You want the people to serve more, then we should serve more. That doesn't mean we should be the only one serving, by the way. We all should serve in some way, shape, or form. But again, not to convict you. Is that cleanup sheet going around yet? All right, listen, but I'll guarantee you There's less than five names on there. Oh, I'm not coming back to this church. 
but I don't have time. But I'm just telling you the truth. That's what it will be. And we're cool. It'll be Pastor Jonah will be down here cleaning the church. And that's what we're doing. Seriously. But that's, that's how we roll. It is. It's just what we do. It don't matter. Because I don't want to just preach it. I want to live it. And that's what Paul says. So Paul says, what I have to do to my body is I don't give in to my fleshly desires. I don't give in to my fleshly desires to want to be served. I don't want to, I don't give in to my fleshly desires to want to take. He goes, I don't do that. So I beat my body. I make it my slave. I make my physical be last. So the spirit can be first. Remember Jesus said to the disciples, the spirit's willing, the flesh is weak. So you got to buffet your body. You got to beat your body. Put it into subjection. Put yourself last so Jesus can be first. Right? And that's what he tells them. And as he moves into chapter 10, it's kind of harsh because he warns them. He warns them. You say, well, Pastor Matt, you know, that's not meant for us. You know, we're, we're under grace, we're saved, we have new life and life in Jesus. So, you know, I don't want to hear this stuff. These are one of the passages you want to like skip over. But it's there for a reason. It's a warning. It's a rebuke. To Christians in a church, just like we have today. No difference. And he warns them. Look what he says. Moreover. Moreover what? Moreover from what? Chapter 10, verse 1. Everything that I taught you about, about giving up your rights, I need to give up my, my rights. He goes, now let me tell you something. Moreover from that, let me teach you something else. Now, let me give you an example. Moreover, my brothers. Now again, who's he talking to? He's not talking to unbelievers. He's talking to believers. We need to get this. He's talking to believers here. He goes, moreover, brethren, my brothers and sisters. You believe Jesus is your Lord and your Savior. I believe Jesus is my Lord and, and my Savior. Let, let me give you some examples. Let me tell you a couple things that will happen to you if you don't surrender and submit. This is what he says. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant. That's King James for saying, you have to know this. Know this. This is very important. Don't be ignorant. Don't say nobody ever told me. Don't say I'm not sure. Don't say I don't know. There's not enough information. That's what being ignorant means. It's ignoramus. Okay? I, I'm not really sure. There's not enough information. I, I, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. I, I don't know if I live my life this way. Well, what's going to Well, he's going to tell us. He's going to tell us exactly. Moreover, brethren, I don't want you to be ignorant. You need to know this, how that, listen, all our fathers were under the cloud. I'll explain this in a minute. And all, he uses the word all five times. And all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased. They were overthrown in the wilderness. What's he talking about? He's using the Old Testament example of the wilderness wanderings and the crossing of the Red Sea for the children of Israel to teach New Testament brethren a lesson. Okay? What's the example? He goes, all our fathers. Now, this is a Gentile church for the most part. They, there weren't many Jews here. There were some. Most of them were Gentiles. And he says, they are our fathers. What? They were all Jews in the Old Testament that God primarily dealt with. And he goes, because we believe in Jesus. Basically, you know, we're God's chosen people also. That's what he's telling them. And he goes, back in the Old Testament, let me tell you a little story, he says. And, and you know what? Some of you might know this, but since you're a Gentile church, a Gentile back to, to them is anybody who wasn't a Jew, which most of us are now here unless you're a full-bred Jew. He goes, let me give you an example. All our fathers, they walked in the wilderness. They crossed over the Red Sea. A cloud followed them. They were baptized unto Moses. They ate spiritual meat. They drank spiritual drink. And a rock followed them. And the rock that followed them was Christ. Now, what is he talking about? This is what he's saying. 
He's saying God took the children of Israel out of Egypt. Remember, they were slaves by reason of their taskmasters, okay? For 400 years, they were slaves. And while they were in slavery to the Egyptians, they were beaten. They were persecuted. They were picked on. Murdered some of them for 400 years. Okay? And then he says, but God did a miracle among them. God sent a deliverer. His name was Moses. Okay, remember Moses spent the first 40 years of his life thinking he was everything. Thinking that his position in Egypt was going to, he was going to be able to free his people, the Jews. It didn't work like that. He spent the next 40 years of his life on the backside of the desert realizing that I'm nothing. And the last 40 years of his life he spent realizing that it's God that's everything. And that's when God used him. Moral of the story is don't wait till you're 80 to let God use you. You can start now. Not that God can't use you when you're 80, but start now. So this is what Moses does. Moses goes to Pharaoh and to the elders of Israel saying, hey, you know what? God sent, sent me, the God you guys have been crying out to, the children of Israel, and he sent me in to be the deliverer to, and then to go tell Pharaoh, let, let, let his people go. They're like, oh, you, Moses? Okay, where you been for the last 40 years? Anyway, you're a nobody now. No one even knows you anymore, right? So basically God does a miraculous work. He rains down on Israel. He judges Israel with lice, with frogs, with dead cattle, with darkness, with the Nile turning to blood, all that whole story. You saw the Ten Commandments, okay? God takes them out with a mighty hand. Two million people start to walk across the Red Sea as the Egyptians pursue them, right? The Egyptian armies are coming down on them after all the plagues came on Egypt. They said, you know what? Let's kill them. I, I can't take this. We're not going to let them go. They're already going. They're starting across the Red Sea. A pillar of fire comes down from heaven and blocks the Egyptians. Now, you would think if you're an Egyptian, hey, you know what? Something's going on here now. Let's leave these guys alone. Well, they don't. They, two million of them cross in the Red Sea, okay? And right before they started to cross the Red Sea, what did they do? They whined. They complained. They said, Moses, we don't know if God's really with you. I don't know about that. What are you doing? Did you bring us out here to destroy us? What is going on? This isn't right. Bring us back to Egypt. They're whining. They're complaining. Next thing you know, the sea opens up. All right. Maybe God is in this. Okay, cool. All right. They go across the sea. As soon as they get out on the other side, the Egyptians are pursuing them. The, the Bible says the, the waters were a wall on them, not to them, not a swamp, a wall, okay, on the right and the left, and comes down and smashes the whole Egyptian army in two seconds. Then they realize they were baptized unto Moses, which means after they come out, they realize, all right, Moses, maybe God is with you, okay? <laughs> That's exa- they were identified with Moses. That's why when we get baptized, we identify with Christ, our leader, okay? Now, that didn't last too long. Shortly after that, they got hungry, and then they got thirsty, and they started to whine and complain again. And they said, well, Moses, that was that Red Sea thing. Hey, that was great. That was cool. But, you know... We're hungry now. It's been a couple days. We got children. God doesn't even care about us or our kids. You're not our leader. What are you doing? This and that. They start to murmur against him. They start to mock him. They start to do all those things again. And they start to complain over and over and over again. So what does God do? God condescends. And he says, okay. They want some flesh. I'll give them flesh. Right? Because God gave them manna. It was angels' food, basically, to eat. So they didn't go hungry. They just had to go gather it up every day. God gave them manna, and they went out and ate, and they said, we're sick of this manna. We want to be back in Egypt where there were leeks and onions and all these things. We want to go back there. But they forgot the fact that they were slaves. And they complained against Moses again. But God fed them. God gave them their flesh. You know what happened with the flesh? The quail, they got so sick of it, the Bible says. It was coming out of their nostrils. They were vomiting. They said, please give us back the manna again. So a little more time goes by. Then they complain. There's no water. Oh, we need water. That happened a few occasions. Whining and complaining, whining and complaining. Moses, what are you doing? Would to God we were back in Egypt. We want to go back to Egypt where we were slaves. See, they wanted to be children of God, but they wanted to live like Egyptians. 
And sad to say, that's where most of the Christian church lives today. Hear me. They want to claim Jesus as their Lord, their Savior, their Messiah, their all. But when you examine their lives, they're living in Egypt. Sad. This is Paul's warning to them. So they whined about water. And Moses comes, right? He strikes the rock, okay? And just water just miraculously comes out of the rock and all couple million of them start drinking. Then it happens again. God says to Moses, speak to the rock and water will come out because they whine again. Moses gets so angry, he strikes the rock twice. Moses got in trouble for that, by the way. But water comes out and they drink again. And then Paul tells us here, look in verse, look at verse chapter 10, look in verse 4. And all did drink, again, it's all, drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So you know who fed them? Christ fed them. You know who gave them water to drink? Christ gave them water to drink. It was Jesus that was there with them as their God in the Old Testament before he came to this earth as a baby. So you know who they really complained against? Not Moses, Jesus. You know who they really got mad at? Not Moses, God, Jesus. And that's what Paul's telling them. But God ch chastened them severely for it. That's why, listen, when you complain and you murmur and you complain, oh, it's my wife, it's my husband, it's Pastor Matt. I get it all the time. It's always my fault. We try to help people. and it's a, Actually, it's more Pastor Jonah than it is me. It's his fault, right? <laughs> right? Seriously, it's his fault and it's everyone else's fault. You know who you complain against? You complain against the Lord. That's who really you complain against. It's a lordship thing. We're just the instruments that God uses. You're just the instrument that God uses. If you go home, you know what, and your wife's cooking you whatever, a nice turkey or quail, we're talking about quail, whatever it is, and it gets burnt, do you say, hey, oven, what's up with this, man? Bang. What'd you do to my quail, oven? And you say, honey, come on, you burned the duck. Come on. We're just the instruments. When we complain, we're really complaining against Jesus, right? And the context here is this. You guys are whining in the church. You guys are complaining in the church. You guys are taking advantage of one another in the church. You guys aren't giving up your rights. You're taking from one another. He goes, what you're really doing is hurting Jesus. Because you don't know what the body of Christ is all about, he's telling them. You don't know that you're all people that Jesus died for, and that's how you need to treat one another. Look what he says. Verse 5. But with many of them... That's an understatement, by the way. With many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. How many was God pleased with? Two. Two out of two and a half million. Joshua and Caleb were the only ones that got to go in to the promised land. You say, well, that's not right. That's not fair. Is that how God looks at the body of Christ? And you know what? Those who are allowed to be used of God in a spirit-filled, God loves them more than the other, you know, 98 that aren't spirit-filled, that they're living fleshly like Egyptians. Does God love them more than others? No, God loves us all the same. But one pastor told me this. God doesn't have favorites. He has intimates. He has intimates. You're either going to be intimate with God and surrender to God Or are you going to be a fleshly Christian, carnal Christian? Look at what he says. Now, he's going to give some examples of the things I just talked about. These are things that they shouldn't have done that we don't want to do. Okay? Verse 6. Now, these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things or desire evil things as they also lusted or desired. Hmm. What was our example? Everything I just talked about, he's going to talk about it again. I just gave you a brief overview. These are our examples. So what are we lusting after? 
What are we desirous of? What is on our hearts this morning? What are we desiring? Look what he says. These are our examples to the intent. So we have an example written down. Wait a minute. The example, all the example of the Old Testament is for us? Yeah. That's why we teach the whole word of God here. The whole thing's the word of God. The Old Testament, they're examples for us to learn what not to do and to learn what to do. Okay? Very simple. Look what he says. These things were examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. The point here is what I talked about the flesh with the quail. They whined about the manna. We want flesh. We want flesh. We want flesh. Now listen, Flesh wasn't all bad. Remember, they had their Passover. They had their lambs. They had those things, but that's all they wanted. That's all they wanted. Now, I'm not saying it's okay to walk in the flesh once in a while. It's not. But the point is this. What do you desire? Evil things, because look what he says. Neither be you idolaters, as were some of them. Now, listen to this. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and to drink, and they rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell one day 3,000 and... Tw- Listen, one day 3 and 20,000, 23,000. It's in the book of Numbers. What's he talking about? The people ate and they drank and they rose up to play as it is written. What's he talking about? Well, let me tell you. It's a euphemism. It's a way to write that the people were having sexual orgies. That's what they were doing. When did they do that? Well, remember, God takes them out. They're like, wow, the Red Sea potted everything else, and this is really good. Moses goes up on the mountain, right? Joshua goes up halfway. Moses goes all the way up, and what happens? Moses up there, com- he's communing with the Lord. He's communing with God, and, and what are the people doing down on the mountain? They, say, they go to Aaron. They say, Aaron, can you make us a God? Can you do me a favor and make us a God? And Aaron, he's not that good of a leader yet. He gives in to the pressure of the people. He really doesn't know what to do. You know, let's just keep the people happy. That's not a pastor's job to keep the people happy. We do the best we can sometimes. Sometimes we feel more like referees than we do pastors. Believe me. You know, you're out. Safe. All right? Oh, that's an umpire. All right. But it's our job to tell people what the Word of God says and do our best to live the Word of God right? So Aaron gives in to the pressure of the people. He goes, well, you know what? Get your earrings, get your golden things, you know, get all your stuff and let's get it together. And Aaron, you know, he takes all the gold and he throws it into a fire. Okay. And there's a calf that he molds. And the people start to worship this idol, this golden calf. And as they're worshiping it, all their humanly fleshly desires come out. Because they want God to be made in their own image. We want to live like Egyptians. The Egyptians were sexually immoral. We can be sexually immoral. The Egyptians lusted after those things. We want to lust after those things. And they start to have sexual orgies, literally at the bottom of the mountain. God tells Moses, you better get down there, Moses. Your people. I'm saying, Moses, God, God, they're not my people. They're your people. Right? You gotta get down there. There's a problem with your people. Moses comes down from the mountain, right? He looks and he goes, What is going on here? Aaron, what are you doing? I left you in charge for five minutes. That's why I don't go away that often because I can't leave the associate pastors in charge here. You know, that's what happens. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Sometimes they're better off. <laughs> but he comes down and, and Aaron, like, is a buffoon. Literally, this is what he says. He goes, Well, I took all the gold and I threw it in the fire and the calf just jumped out. That's what he said. <laughs> kind of, it's not my fault. It's the fire's fault and it's the gold's fault. So I really, what do you want me to do, Moses? But you know what Moses does? Moses says, take that calf, grind it up, smash it to powder, and make the people eat it. If you can eat your God and if you can grind up your God into powder, you got a problem. You say, Pastor Matt, I don't do that. Well, listen, do you, are you worshiping the, the, your cash flow? Because I can grind that up into powder, into paper, and make you eat it. Are you worshiping your things? Right? You worshiping your drugs, your alcohol? 
You worship in anything else but Jesus? If you are, you're an idolater. The Bible says, listen, covetousness is idolatry. What are you desiring? What are you desiring? What are you running after? And that's what he tells them. He goes, don't be like them. Don't be like them. Now we have whole mass movements in the Christian church that's literally, that's what they teach people. That you can name it and you can claim it. Right? You can speak it and it's yours. Whatever you want, God's going to give you. You know what? Because that's what you want to be your God. Sad. Sad. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they lusted. Neither be you idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, that sexual sin. Don't talk to me, Pastor Matt, about that. <laughs> Listen to what he says here. As some of them committed and fell in one day. 23,000. Read the book of Numbers. Well, Pastor, and I know the scholars out there are saying, well, the number says 24,000 fell. Wait a minute. In one day, 23,000 fell. And a few days after, 24,000 fell. The Bible is accurate. So what happened on that occasion? They were, they were committing idolatry, right? They were engaged in sexual sin. This is how they were engaged in sexual sin. Remember, there was this prophet for hire. His name was Balaam. Okay, Balaam comes, right? He's hired by Balak from Moab. Balak's worried about the children of Israel because they're growing to be a mighty people. He hears there's this living God among them. He hears about this pillar of fire by night and this cloud by day. And he goes, what are we going to do? He hears about some of their conquests. He goes, what, am I, what are we going to do? They're coming our way. He goes, let me hire this you know, modern day prophet. Now, this guy was a spiritual guru. He had some spiritual power. His name was Balaam. Balaam, he, he basically hires Balaam to overlook the children of Israel and to curse them. He hires them. Balaam goes up to curse the people, and a blessing comes out of his mouth. And he goes, what are you doing? I hired you to curse these people, and you're blessing these people. He goes, well, wait a minute. Balaam says, well, let me figure something out because I really want the money. He got paid a lot from, from uh, Balak, by the way. And he goes, well, let me go to another side of the mountain over here, and maybe I can curse him from there. So he tries to curse him from there, and a blessing comes out of his mouth. He does it again, and then the last time, he does it again, and he goes, how beautiful are you, Israel? How beautiful are your people? He really blesses them. God, like, puts his words in a pagan's mouth. But Balaam's pretty shrewd. You know what he says? He goes, I can't curse him because God is with them. God does love those people. Even though they're rebellious, God loves them. And he goes, but I got an idea. Send in some of the hottest chicks you got. This is what he says. Your Moabitish women, send them in unto them. Right? And little by little, they'll turn the hearts of the young men away from God, and God will have to chastise them. And that's exactly what happened. And then 23,000 of them fell in one day. You say, well, wait a minute, Pastor Matt. Wait a minute. I've been committing sexual sin for this long, and I just, I'm not falling down. I'm not dead. I'm still at it because I'm under grace, and Jesus is with me, and me and Jesus got this thing going on, and he, he knows about that because every time I do it, I just say I'm sorry, and I just keep doing it and keep doing it. I'm sorry and keep doing it. Okay, all right, all right, I, I get that. He forgives you, but you keep doing it, and you keep doing it. He said, I'm not dead. And I know other Christians who have committed sexual sin after sexual sin and drunkenness and, and, and whatever it is, you know, dr drug addicts, and they just do it forever. And they're not fallen, they're not dead. Well, I know some of them that are. So you're just trying to scare me. No, I'm telling you what the Bible says. And I, I know some of them that have lost their testimony and they're put on a shelf. No longer used of God. Wasted their lives. Wasted. 
You know, Paul writes to the Galatian church. Remember what he said? Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever you sow, that shall you also reap. He's not writing that to unbelievers. That's to believers. So Pastor Matt, you're just trying to scare me. That's okay. If I'm trying to scare you into holy living, that's a good thing. Because listen, I fear God. I fear God more than I fear anything in anybody else. I fear displeasing him more than anything in anybody else. More than I fear my mother, my father, my wife, my this, my that, my, my boss. Oh, he's going to get me. I'll get fired. No, I fear him more than anybody else. I don't want to be chastised by him because it hurts more. Amen. Listen, do you know why it hurts more? You know why it hurts more? Because he loves me more. And he's not going to let me get away with it. Right? This is a warning to a church. Don't waste your life is what he's telling them. Listen, verse 9, neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted. And they were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur you as some of them murmured. And we're destroyed of the destroyer. What is he talking about here? They kept whining. They kept murmuring. They kept blaming Moses. They kept gossiping about the leadership. They kept doing all those things behind. Listen, then the Bible tells us in Numbers, they murmured in their tents. That means their husband and wife were home plotting against Moses together. Yeah, listen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, you know who's in the tent with them? Jehovah. God's in there. Jesus is in there. Okay. When you go out of here and you take a shot at me, I don't care. Go ahead. I love, I love you anyway, and I love Jesus. But you know who's, who hears you. Jesus does. So go ahead. Now, this isn't one of those, you know, those psycho sermons about don't, don't, don't touch God's anointed, you know, or else you'll all go down for the count. You could say whatever you want about me. I could, I could kill less because I love you and I love Jesus. That's what Paul said, by the way. You can say whatever you want about me. Because it's a small thing that you're going to say something about me, Paul said. Because my, my job is to love you, to warn you, to teach you, to preach the gospel. And whether you, you love me or you hate me, that's what I'm supposed to do because Jesus loves you. But it says they murmured and they gossiped and they rebelled against the leadership. Remember the, the sons of Korah? That's what this is talking about. Now, who are the sons of Korah? Well, the sons of Korah, and then Dathan's alongside with them, and they go to Moses and Aaron. They say, well, Moses, Moses, God doesn't want you just to be the leader here, Moses. You know what? We, and, and Aaron, you, you're a clown, Aaron, basically, is what they, t they say to him. They say, we are supposed to have your spot. You know what Moses does? Moses doesn't sit there and say, hey, you know what? God gave me, made me the leader. These are my credentials. Look, everything I've done. I got my degree here. You know what? Let me just lay it out for you. This is what Moses says. Don't do this. Don't do this. He gets on his face. He falls on his face. He humbles himself before them. And he goes, don't do this. I can't help but God chose me. And especially Aaron, this guy, he's like, I don't know. God just told me to go with him. <laughs> That's what he told me. He goes, don't do this. God chose us. Don't do this. Because they weren't complaining against Moses and against Aaron. They were complaining against God's choice. God's choice. Again, I wouldn't choose me to do this. Believe me. I would not. But I can't help it. I just got to do what God wants me to do. Thank you, Lord. Whatever. They keep complaining. They keep whining. They keep murmuring. They keep gossiping. They try, they, they try to rebel against them. And divide Israel. And then the ground opens up, swallows them, and they drop straight into hell. Read it, book of Numbers. You say, Pastor Matt, well, if I saw that happen, you know, I'd stop gossiping about you and everyone else here. You know, <laughs> if God just let it shh right here, I'm going down into the pit, I'd stop that. No, you know what happens though? You know the way the Lord chastises us? For the most part, He leaves you in that sin. He leaves you in that rebellious state. He leaves you in that state of rebellion and gossip and envy and pride. And you're so blind to yourself, it's like you're in a pit. And you can't get out. And it's sad. Now look what he says. 
Now all these things happened unto them for examples or in samples that they were written, verse 11, for our admonition to teach us something upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. You want to see a spirit-filled Christian? Listen to me. You want to know somebody who loves Jesus and is trying to go more on for Jesus? Listen to me. There's only two words in between stand and then lest he fall. It's take heed. Take heed. Somebody that loves Jesus, somebody that wants to go on for Jesus, you know what? Listens to counsel, listens to the word of God and says, hey, I better check myself in this area. Hey, before I cast judgment on this person, I, I, I better keep my mouth shut. I better watch out. I better check what's going on in my own heart. You better take heed. Because if you start walking around thinking you're an authority, you're going down. That's what it says. Take heed lest you fall. And then I love it. I love it. This is what happens. People come, they do this, they get familiar, they start to serve, and next thing you know, in four or five months, they, they know more than you, they know more than everybody else. And I start getting nervous. I'm like, oh, Lord. They used to have a teachable spirit, and it's right out the window now. Listen, when my pastor calls me, I just do what he says. You say, well, no, he's not an authority. He's not over you. You're your own church. This church is autonomous. You don't have to listen to him. My pastor calls me. Listen, we have our own men's conference now. We had 65 people here this year. You know what? He has a men's conference. He said, I want you to support my men's conference. I said, well, Randy, you know, we have our own men's conference now. You know, it's too much of a... My pastor asked me to do something. I just do it. I just do it. Because it's not the point of, well, this and that and who's right and who's wrong. It's the point of my heart. Do I, do I still have a teachable spirit? Because if I don't have a teachable spirit, you know what? The Holy Spirit can't use me. Can't use me. Well, I don't agree with the, with the way they do things. And that's not right. I'm a man unto myself. No, I'm not. No, you're not. No one's going to tell me what to do. Please, with that. How's it worked out for you so far with nobody telling you what to do? <laughs> Seriously. No, think about it. How's it work? Worked out well. Some of us end up in jail. Some of us end up, you know, almost ruined our lives. You know, really, ruining other people's lives. No one's going to tell me what to do. Well, okay. All right. Well, I think Paul's kind of telling them what not to do here, right? So I think that's what we're supposed to do with one another. Don't do this. Don't do that. But make sure when you're doing it, you have the right heart and the right spirit. Take heed. Take heed if you think you stand, because you'll fall. The Bible says examine yourself. Check your heart. Last verse. Now listen. They have no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able, but with the temptation also will make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. What's he talking about here? He's anticipating their argument. He's anticipating their argument. He's anticipating them saying, well, Paul, you don't know what we go through. You're, you're really intelligent. You are a Pharisee. You understand the Bible. you got all these things. God's given you all these gifts. You are an apostle. That's why you can live for Jesus. You don't know what I go through. I love that one. People tell me, well, you don't know what I go No, I don't know. And I wouldn't want to go through some of what, what, what you've gone through. But the point is that Jesus knows you. God loves you. He knows what you go through. Right? You don't know what I battle with. You don't know the, it's the woman that you gave me. And all this stuff. It's either God's word or it's not. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Now, common doesn't mean that we're all tempted with the same things the same way. What it means is this, you're not unique. Okay? You're not unique. You can't sit there and say, well, the things I go through, nobody goes through. And the things I go through, nobody goes through. And that's why I can't get victory. Because you don't know. No, again, I don't know. And they don't know. But you know, and God knows. 
You're not unique. Well, if you, if you went through the things that I went through and had the upbringing that I had, and you know what, and, and, and it's my family origin, it's, it's, it's my background, it's my, my, my lack of a father around, it's my this, it's my that, I was sexually abused as a child, all this stuff. You know what, so were in a lot of other people too. You say, and I'm not minimizing your pain. But the Bible says that's no excuse to continue on in your sin. It's no excuse to stay in it. Because you're not unique. You're a sinner like everybody else. Look what he says. But God is faithful. Listen, who will not allow you or suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able. It means God knows your threshold. God knows what you can endure. Now God doesn't, listen, God doesn't do the temptation to you. He doesn't sit there and say, hey, let me torture my child here for a little while and see how much they can handle. Yeah. That, that's sadistic. God doesn't do that. But what God does do you do is to you is protect you. Because he knows Satan wants to have his way with you. And with that, he says, Satan, I'll let you go this far, but no further. I'll let you go this far, but no further. Because that will break them. Because that will destroy them. Because that will, you know, they will be totally lost if I let you do that to them. So I'm going to let you go this far, but no further. Read the book of Job. Read it. Battle going on in the heavenlies between God and Satan. God says, okay. You only think Job loves me because I bless him? Then I'll, I'll, I'll let some things be in your hands, but you cannot take his life. God stops him. He will not let you be tempted above that which you can bear. That's why we cannot sit there and say, I couldn't help it. And it was my mother. And it was my father. And it was my upbringing. And it was my past. And you don't know. And you don't understand. And this and that. And whining and complaining and everything else. And it makes me crazy, all the isms. And the addicts. Well, I have alcoholism. And I'm an addict. I'm a sex addict. I'm a drug addict. I'm a greed addict. I'm, a, I'm an everything addict. I'm a shoe addict. I got to have these certain amount of shoes. Whatever. Everyone's, I'm an addict, whatever. It's called sin. That's what we all are. Everybody's something. Okay? Everybody's addicted to something. Because we bent to sin. Well, again, don't get mad at me. Get mad at Jesus. That's what he said. That's what the word of God says. That's what God says. Now, I know some of you are thinking right now, again, well, Pastor Matt, if you were in my shoes, you'd fall through too. And I probably would, but I'm not in your shoes. I'm only in my shoes. But I do know this, that God is faithful. I do know this, that if I deny myself in those areas when I want to go this way, and I'm bent toward doing that, and I want to do this, and, and all my will, and all of my flesh, and all of my evil, and all my inventions and intentions in my mind want to go this way, if I say, Jesus, that is not what you want, please help me. Please forgive me. Please strengthen me. I do know this, every time I humble myself, my God softens my heart. And the Holy Spirit fills me again, and I can have victory over that. And I can go on in that. And I can come back again and say, honey, you know what? It's my fault. It's my fault. That's what I have to do a lot. Because I fight with my wife, too. It's my fault, because I'm not being the man God wants me to be. And listen, guys, if you read your Bibles, you're the initiator. She's the responder. That's why she always has the hope that you're going to do better and do the right thing. And when you go to God and you let the Lord soften your heart and you're willing to take it all, well, maybe she is this and maybe she is that and maybe she is this. Well, half the reason why she's like that is because you brought her down and that's how you guys are reacting to one another. Well, doesn't she, isn't she accountable for Jesus for her own sin? Yeah, she is. She can't blame you either. Can't blame you either. But I do know this. Every time I've initiated. Every time I've humbled myself, every time I said, I'm sorry, it's my fault. You know what? In all the this and the that, yeah, that was her. Yeah, that was me. That was it. But you know what? As the head of the home, I said, it's my fault. Ultimately, it's my fault. She responds. 
and God softens her heart. But you don't know, Pastor Matt. But you don't know. No, but Jesus knows. He knows. He knows. And he's able to give you, listen, the last part of the verse, it doesn't sound cushy. It doesn't sound easy. It actually sounds difficult. But look what it says. That you are able, but with the temptation, also he'll make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Listen, when you're bearing something, when you're going through something, when you're holding something, it's not easy. Those of you who have a, here that have, have messed with weights, if you want to get like a big chest and all that, you can't just put 45 pounds on the bar and go like this all day. <laughs> oh, yeah, looks good. And the girls walk by, oh, he's a pretty strong guy. Yeah, <laughs> you know, good. You have to put stuff on there to bear, Right? You have to push yourself to barely get it up. But God says you'll get it up with his strength. But it's not easy. And then what God does with you and in you, when you bear it, when you make it through, when you come on the other side, you're that much more stronger to be a blessing to others. That's his reason for allowing you to go through things. Because he wants to use you more. He wants to fill you more. He wants to bless you more.